Hello viewers and welcome to Skeptics in the Hub. We have the, the subject tonight is something that's very popular even from a very young age, dinosaurs. And we have a great expert with us tonight from the Natural History Museum in London. It is Dr. Susie Maidment. Hello Susie. Hi John, how are you? I'm fine, how the devil are you? Uh, I'm very well, thank you. It's very nice to be here tonight. Okay, yes. You know, well, this is a, a terrific opportunity because I've got children who have, you know, they've loved dinosaurs since they were born, it seems. Difficult to imagine, but <laughs> that's what it seems like. And uh, the first question I want to ask you is, what is a dinosaur? What is a dinosaur? Okay, well... Actually, that's not as straightforward to explain as you might expect. Mm. So dinosaurs um, obviously were animals that lived during the Mesozoic period, which is from about 230 to 66 million years ago. But not every animal that was alive then was a dinosaur, of course. There were also uh, reptiles that were um, early mammals or uh, mammal-like reptiles. Um, and of course, there were lizards and there was there were crocodiles and crocodilomorphs and things like that as well. So dinosaurs are characterized by a series of features of the hip bones and the feet, which mean that they held their legs underneath their bodies. So in a, in a kind of upright position. So if you imagine, I can't do this without miming, so forgive the mime, but if you imagine um, like lizards and crocodiles, they kind of walk with their arms out to the side like that. Yeah. Whereas dinosaurs have their legs underneath their bodies. So they yeah. walked with their legs underneath their bodies, a bit more like mammals do. Um, and that's a, a, a really characteristic feature um, of the dinosaurs. Well, I like to think of it as, you know, wheels. A car has wheels that stick out sideways, but maybe a crane is up on, you know, tall legs that go down. That's just yeah, a sort it's of, a good analogy, yeah. a sort yeah. of an engineering alternative view. Yeah. <clears throat> so, okay, we know what they are now. They're reptiles, but their legs go downwards. Mm -hmm. That's right. So, so... There's so many questions we, we need to ask you here because they mysteriously became extinct, or did they? <laughs> well, dinosaurs aren't actually extinct. The, the non-bird dinosaurs are extinct, but birds are actually dinosaurs. So birds evolved from the dinosaurs, and that means that in a biological sense, they are actually dinosaurs. So the dinosaurs yeah. aren't extinct. They're actually the most speciose terrestrial vertebrate today, with over 10,000 living species. So, yeah. um, you know, dinosaurs are all around us. They're with us every day. Um, yeah. But the non-avian dinosaurs, so the ones that we tend to think of um, as yeah, you know, yeah. sort of big, big scaly things uh, wandering around in the Jurassic, they, they are extinct, but probably not so mysteriously. We, we have a, a pretty good idea of why they went extinct. Um, and that's, I guess, um, yeah. most people will be familiar with the, the meteorite that hit the Earth at the end of the Cretaceous period. So, you know, most mm. paleontologists are now very comfortable with that being the reason that the dinosaurs died out. Yeah, yeah. Yes, we, we have more bird dinosaurs, avian dinosaurs, still around than we have mammals, don't we? I mean, there's we only do, about 4,000 4, mammals, and most of them are bats. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, that's absolutely right. Birds birds actually really dominate our ecosystems today, yeah, and, and they are dinosaurs. Yeah. Yes, fantastic. So I'm going to put a, mo a notice up now to remind people that if they want to ask a question, rather than just chat amongst themselves, we'd like them to put a queue in front of their comment. Great. Okay, so are, they, are the dinosaurs, um, the problem with them is that they, we only know them through their fossils. And so that's a misrepresentation of their, their number, their geography their location because not many things fossilize what sort of fossils of dinosaurs do you have yeah that's that's totally true um you know the question that i get asked a lot um by people is but are there very many dinosaurs still to find um and of course you know that there, there are an enormous number of fossils that that we have yet to find in new species of dinosaur because they lived on every continent um, and they're around for 170 million years, so for a really, really long time. Um, and as you say, our fossil record is highly biased. 
Um, and it's biased by where we look for fossils. So obviously here in the UK and in North America, we've been looking intensively for dinosaur fossils for probably 150 years. But in other parts of the world, the study of, of, of dinosaurs and, and the, the discovery of dinosaurs is really in its infancy. Um, and so we have a very unevenly sampled fossil record geographically. Now, of course, we also have, through time, we have rocks that are deposited on land, which is where we find dinosaurs, and then rocks that are deposited in the sea. And there were no dinosaurs that lived all of their lives in the sea. So if we find if we have marine rocks of a particular time period, then we're not we're very unlikely to find dinosaur fossils in them. So we have uneven sampling through time. And then, of course, as you, as you say, not everything fossilizes when it dies. Um, so that means that, you know, big things, they tend to have stand a better chance of being fossilized because um, they might be their big bones might be able to withstand geological forces over time. Mm. But mm. smaller things might just get crushed and, and ground up mm. and, and disappear. And we will never have a fossil record of those. Mm. Yeah. So first of all, they've got to get fossil which is you know, quite a high hurdle anyway, because most dead creatures rot or, or get predated. Is it predated or scavenged? Yeah. Technically, scavenged, if they're already dead. Yeah, so that, that's the first hurdle that a fossil has to jump over. It has to die somewhere that it will be preserved from decay. And the next hurdle it has to jump over is it has to be found. And we can only look for it at outcrops like Kimmeridge for example where the, the chalk at the cliff has been crumbling for centuries yeah absolutely so um you know it, I live here in Sussex uh, where some of the first dinosaurs were were found and yeah. the ground underneath me here is absolutely full of dinosaur fossils yes. um, but the problem is that it's all covered in trees and houses so we don't <laughs> find them very often um, we do find them at the coast where the cliffs erode. So places like Hastings and also on the Isle of Wight, we have the same rocks as we do here. And that's yeah, where we yeah. find the dinosaurs, where they're being weathered out. Now, if we go over to places like um, Utah and Wyoming in the US, which is where a place where I spend a lot of time, where I do a lot of work, um, the rocks there are um, obviously much better exposed because it's a desert. So there's much yes. less vegetation. Um, there's, there's virtually no people. Wyoming's the size of the UK and has a population of 400,000 people. Uh, it's about the same size as Ed of Edinburgh, I believe, the population. So, you know, really yes. there's nobody there. Um, yes. And so there's a lot of opportunity to find stuff. Um, there's lots more rock exposed and there's no trees and buildings and, and houses and stuff like that. So. No, no NIMBYs. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. yeah. So actually, uh, we had a, an earlier uh, show on paleontology in general, and I invited Alex and... Uh, Dr. Martin Munt, who you yes. may know from from Dinosaur Isle, yes. and he he used to work at your your same establishment for a while, and I did invite them to come tonight, but I don't know whether it was a bit of a late invitation, to be honest. So I don't know whether they're going to be able to make it, but uh, they have been sent an invitation. You might meet them on screen if they turn up. Yeah. No. Well, we, you know we. We're a relatively small community, actually, the people that work yes. in dinosaurs. You can imagine there's yeah. there's not tons of us, so we do tend to all know each other, yeah. Yes, yes, grouped together. Yes, so, so you're absolutely right. There's probably millions of dinosaurs underneath Sussex, but they're just too deep. We're never going to find them. And it wouldn't be feasible to mine for them either. Although oh, yeah, you do I, find, you do find some I'm, fossils during mining, don't you? You can do. Uh, um, you know, some of the really early fossils, so um, first, some of the first really complete specimens of dinosaurs um, were actually found in a coal mine in Belgium. So that, they were iguanodon. Oh. And again, they were actually found in the same group of rocks that we have here in Sussex. Uh, they were found in, over in Belgium. Um, some coal miners were digging uh, down and they found a, effectively a herd of fossilized iguanodon specimens in a coal mine. So that's, that was really cool. And, and um, actually in, in Canada, there's been some discoveries, a really cool one recently um, of a beautiful armored dinosaur that they actually found whilst um, excavating uh, or you know, quarrying there. Uh, but the, the, the problem is that, you know, in the, in the olden days, um, we used to find a lot of fossils like that. So um, all of the quarries were worked by hand and the yes. quarrymen would spot the fossils. So a lot of 
the, uh, the, the fossils that we have from the UK in, I'm sorry, my computer has just decided to shut itself down. So I'm just going to re-log in. My password. You're still here. Okay, that's good to know. <laughs> I can't, so there we go, we're back. Sorry about that. Um, yeah. yeah, so a lot of the fossils that we have in the Natural History Museum, historic fossils um, of things like Iguanodon um, from the UK, uh, were actually found by quarrymen when the wheels and the rocks down here were being quarried for stone by hand. But of course, now these rocks are quarried by enormous equipment. And so the fossils just get destroyed. Yes, so yes, we, we don't, don't find them in the same no, way. We, we don't do mining or quarrying carefully now, do we? We do it with explosives and vast machines. That's not going to help. No, that is true. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult to find things here these days. Yeah. So tell me a bit about yourself. How did you get to be the you you are today? Okay, so this, this story sounds like it's not true, but it actually is true, um, I promise. Um, when I was about six, um, my grandpa, who was a very clever man, he was an electrical engineer, um, he said to me, what are you going to be when you grow up? It's a very serious conversation. And I, uh, at the time, wasn't sure whether I was going to be a scientist or a princess. Now, uh, which is completely reasonable, I think you'll agree. And <laughs> him being a very, uh, you know, he, he was very, very keen um, to persuade me away from uh, pain into, uh, away from princess and encourage me into scientist. So he said, what sort of scientist are you going to be? But I was six and I hadn't, I hadn't realised that there were different sorts of scientists. Yes. So he said, well, why don't you be a dinosaur scientist? You know, I love dinosaurs. I have plastic dinosaurs and a dinosaur money box and a blow up Pegasaurus. So he said, well, why don't you be a dinosaur scientist? So I said, okay. I will. So I did. So that made a lot of sort of, you know, those those awkward careers discussions at school where you yes. put your thesis and your A levels and what are you going to yes. do at university? It did make all of that a bit more straightforward for me because I did know what I was going to do since I was six. So. I don't know many people who chose their career at the age of six. Well, do you know, actually, when you talk to dinosaur workers, surprisingly, a, a number, a large number did. Besides really? age six, so that was what they were going to do. So. Wow. Yeah. So that, that's, a, that's a sort of fossilised career choice. <laughs> so your, your specialism, stegosaurs? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I work on sort of broadly all of the bird hip dinosaurs. So the bird hip dinosaurs are um, a group of dinosaurs um, which include things like Triceratops, so the horned and frilled dinosaurs, um, Iguanodon with the thumb spikes, um, the hadrosaurs with the, the crests, um, and as you say, the armoured dinosaurs. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> so the yeah. the the, the plated cool. dinosaurs, the stegosaurs, and the ankylosaurs, which are the kind of small armoured tank-like walking coffee tables with tail clubs. What's what's that crest for? Well, it's an excellent question, John. Um, it, we don't know. We don't know, but there are obviously some some different ideas. Um, it could be a dis it could be for display, so it could be that we have um, males and females with slightly different shaped crests. Very difficult yes. to tell in the fossil record um, whether yes. that's right or not, um, because we just don't have the sample sizes, and often we don't have the age control to know whether we're looking no. at two different no. species or or males and females of, of the same uh, the no. same species, and we can't tell the sex no. of dinosaurs either. No. So very no. difficult to tell that. Um, yeah. It could be. So somebody did a really cool, my, my colleagues um, in, in Canada did a really, really cool experiment where they um, they did some beautiful CT scanning of the skull uh, of one of these hadrosaurs. And they um, looked at all the air cavities, so the, the nasal yes. bones, the nose bones yes. extend right the way up. Yes. Um, into the, and they, they actually kind of digitally or virtually um, blew air through this crest and it made a honking uh -huh. noise. Um, oh. And they showed that they're, the smaller, the juveniles, actually had a kind of higher pitched honking yes. than the, than the yes. adults. So yes. maybe it was a communication device, um, you, you know, yes. and maybe that was for for some sort of, you know, interest specific type display function or yes. you know, chatting function as well. So we don't we don't really really know um, no. to be honest with you. Um, but you know, many many weird things in nature seem to be to do with sex. So I wouldn't put it. I would, you know, wouldn't be surprised if it was something to do with uh, yes, uh, yes. interest-specific display. Well, it's no more weird than a cockerel's comb compared to a hen's lesser comb yeah, and all exactly. the wattles that they have. Yeah. yeah. 
Exactly. So, many, many birds have these sorts of display um, structures. So, yeah. Yeah, yes, yes. I love that st that hypothesis of the musical instrument. Yeah. <laughs> of, course, of course, it makes sense in audio terms for the small ones to be high pitched and the large ones to be deeper. Well, one of the really cool things that we can do now, you know, there's a lot of technology uh, that is applied to paleontology now. And I think, you know, some people think of us as being a kind of like dusty old subject. One of my colleagues who's a geologist once disparagingly uh, suggested that all we do is look at fossils and write down what they look like. But actually, you know, we do a lot more than that. We, uh, we apply yes. a lot of different techniques to, um, our, to study our fossils. And um, CT scanning has really re revolutionized um, a lot of the way that we can look at these things. And, yes. and so we can do the experiments um, like that yes. and actually find out, you know, what, what might have happened. Yes, absolutely. Well, of course, early biology, back in the days of nature study, it was purely observation, wasn't it? There, we, hadn't, we had no biochemical or microbiological equipment to investigate further than the morphology of organisms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm. So you said something earlier about um, land dinosaurs. And you sort of implied that maybe there weren't very many watery ones, no aquatic dinosaurs. But what about plesiosaurs? Oh, plesiosaurs or I... aren't dinosaurs. Yeah, they're, they're marine ah. reptiles. So they're, they're reptiles ah. that lived at the same time as dinosaurs. But remember yeah, yeah. earlier, I said yes, you know, yes. dinosaurs have these legs underneath their bodies, and plesiosaurs yes. don't. You know, they have these 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 uh, uh, flappers, uh, flappers, yes. flippers, yes. flippers, uh, yes. out held out to the sides of their bodies. And they're probably more closely related to lizards than they were to dinosaurs, actually. Yes, yes, that makes sense. Yeah, although well, it's a bit difficult Look, to tell, but probably. Looking at the body plan, that does make sense, doesn't it? Yes. So I get a lot of people who say fossils are no evidence for evolution because you weren't there and, and you can't say that creature fossil A turned into fossil B because you're... All you have is a gappy record and all you're doing is making inferences, guesses rather than actual evidence. What are you going to say to them? Um, OK, there's so many answers to that. But um, let's start with the fact that, that there's no proof of anything in any science except for potentially maths. Um, oh. Everything else, we just we propose hypotheses and then we test them. And all we can do is disprove something, leaving only one solution. So, yes. you know, there is there is no proof in science. So that, that's no. the first one. So, you know, we can we could if, we, yes. if we're going to use that argument, that 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 it yes. applies to all yes. the science. Thanks, um, thank like, heavens to Popper. Yes. So there's this also there's this idea that um, there's no missing links. Um, yeah. Which I don't, I've never really understood because every single fossil is a missing link between something else. You know, yes. I mean, what, what do you want? Like every time, you know, we, we, there are even, even in the dinosaur fossil records, and um, particularly in places like in Alberta in Canada from about um, 75 yeah. million years ago, mm. the fossil yeah. record and the dating of the sediments is so incredible and is at such yes. incredible high resolution. Layers. Fabulous work, yeah, yeah done, done yeah. by... Um, some of my colleagues at the Royal Tarong Museum have just done some beautiful work on the stratigraphy there. And they, you can actually see these hadrosaurs with their crests that we've been talking about. You can see one form, the crest sh slowly changing shape. And, yes. and over time, as you go up through the formation, and it looks like yes. the same species, but it's slowly, gradually, the crests are changing shape. And yes. actually, you know, species are an entirely human construct. Yes, you know, they, they, they come from our need to have to envelope something and yes, call it yes. a name. Boxes. Um, yes. Yeah, absolutely. And so, of course, of course, there's not a missing link between this one and this one because we've artificially separated them into two boxes. But actually, yes. when you look at the fossil record, it's very, very clearly you can see these trans transitional yes. series in places like that. Um, but you know, every fossil in the end is a missing link between two other others. It just it doesn't make any sense. I've never understood those. Yes, things. yes. And if you could go forward and look back in time, we'd be a missing link. Right, exactly, yeah, yeah. Because evolution hasn't stopped. Yeah. So it's like a, it's like a frozen movie, isn't it? You can, you've got a strip of film and you can look at the slides, the individual frames, and see the changes. So, so there's yeah, two 
there are two sorts of evidence for evolution, isn't there? There's evidence of change actually happening, which we can see with short lifespan creatures like bacteria and fruit flies and things like that. Mm -hmm. And then there's, then there's, here's a record of what happened in the past. What's the most likely explanation for all these physical objects? And that is, they changed. It's change. Yeah, so it's, it's sort of applying change in the past. That's yeah. all. Right. Now, you said something else, I think, about, oh, no, you didn't say this, but I'm going to say this. What colour are dinosaurs? What colour are dinosaurs? That's yeah, a great question. Of course, all the depictions that we had, certainly in my childhood, when colour printing hadn't been invented, <laughs> they were all grey. They're all black and white. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, so. that it is a great question. Um, and if you'd asked me that question maybe 10 years ago, I would have said, we don't know and we'll never know the answer. But um, I would have been wrong um, because fairly recently, well, as I say, in the last decade, um, people started to identify um, structures in feathers. So fossilised feathers. So obviously um, we discussed that birds are dinosaurs. So many, yes. many of the meat-eating dinosaurs were feathered and we have their feathers preserved. And when people started to use um, very high powered microscopes to look at the feathers, they discovered cellular structures that are melanosomes. So these are the cells that bear color, that bear melanin in, in living bird feathers. And these, in living bird feathers, these cells, uh, that the shape of the cell determines the color or, or correlates with the color of the feather. Now you can only do this with some some colours, so you can only do it with kind of browns and greys. Also iridescence. It depends on how the melanosomes are stacked. Um, so we don't. You can't see things like blues and yellows like this, but you can see browns and reds and and, and greys and blacks. Um, and what they found was that the same shaped melanosomes were being seen in these fossil feathers as well. So they were able to identify fossil feathers that were red and that were brown and black and iridescent and things like this. And so there's been some lovely work where you've got stripy feathers and you've got a dinosaur with a sort of red, red part on its head and then black parts on its body. Um, at the moment, so there's been some suggestion that you can also do this with scaly skin although that's a little bit more up for debate. So we can see melanosomes in scaly skin, but there's been some suggestion that actually in living reptiles, the shape of the melanosome doesn't correlate so well to the color in living, in, uh, living animals with scaly skin. Oh. So it's a little bit more up for debate, but um, mm. there's been a lot of work done recently on counter shading. So that's the kind of, if you imagine a deer where it's got a kind of brown back and then a white underbelly, um, there's been a bit of work done that suggested that there's been a few herbivorous dinosaurs that might have had that kind of colouring based on melanosomes. Um, but as I say, we'll never, we'll never be, well, we won't be able to see the blues and the yellows and the and the and the pinks and the oranges like that. So we can have a we can, we can get it we can get a, an idea of what some of the dinosaur colours might have been. Um, but maybe some of the more exotic colours we we can still leave up to our imagination. So if you want, we can still still have like a a red and purple striped stegosaurus that's fine so we're pretty sure that they had color a few colors but the jury is still out upon a full spectrum yeah and well it, it's difficult because those colors are formed um differently they're not formed from melanosomes and so the, the soft tissues the, the 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 proteins that cause those colors um in the in the skin and in the fossils aren't preserved in the fossil record we haven't found them in the right fossil record yet so right. that's the problem at the moment is that is that we can't see those colors. I mean, we can obviously we can we can go to analogy. So we can look at um, living yes. reptiles and we can look at um, living mammals and we can say you know, what sorts of colors we do. What do animals usually do? And, you know, herbivores, they don't really want to be eaten. So they tend to go for camouflage. Yes. Um, yes. Predators don't really want herbivores to see them. So they, they also yes. tend to go yes. to camouflage. Yes. So chances are yes. that they, you know, dinosaurs had sort of that, that sort of. They, they probably weren't purple and red striking. But, yeah, you know. they, they might have been a bit like mammals, in, in which yeah. case some of them can see colour and some of them can't. 
the only way we can determine things like that is basically to look at the uh, their closest living relatives. So that's um, a, a good way of doing it. And the closest living relatives of the of the dinosaurs are, are the birds and the crocodiles. So mm. if we know that birds can see in colour and crocodiles mm -hmm. can see in colour, then birds and crocodiles share a common ancestor um, that dinosaurs also share. So we can be pretty certain that dinosaurs also uh, saw in colour. Off the top of my head, I have no idea whether crocodiles see in colour or not, actually. Um, I'm pretty sure birds can. Uh, but I don't yes. know about crocodiles, so I have to get back to you on that one. Uh, right. Yeah, it, it would be stupid for birds not to be able to see in colour when they are so brightly coloured themselves yeah, exactly. for, sexual, yeah. for sexual purposes. Yeah. Iridescence. Now, that doesn't that depend upon very tiny layers of reflective surfaces that the light bounces about inside and... Now, I am a geologist, John. My photo has just, my photo, my computer has just closed down again. Sorry. So what, I, what I'm heading towards is, have we been able to find surfaces of dinosaurs that are uh, physically constructed in a way that would provide iridescence? Well, okay, so as I say, I'm a geologist, so I uh, my background is rocks, uh, but so bear with me. <laughs> but um, the um, yeah, it's not biology, but the melanosomes, the stacking pattern of the melanosomes in the feathers, in certain, when they're stacked in a certain way, that's what causes iridescence in um, living birds, and they have seen that same stacking pattern in dinosaur uh, feathers. Um, and dinosaur okay. Fossils. Okay. So that has okay. led people to suggest, now, don't ask me about the physics of how that actually works, because that is beyond me. Well, I'm skating on the edge of my knowledge, too, because <laughs> I'm, I'm just a humble science teacher retired. <laughs> now, have we got any fossilised dinosaur eyes that we can examine the retinas of and see whether they've got cones? No. Not to my knowledge that there are no fossilised dinosaur eyes, to my knowledge. Soft parts usually decay, of course. Yes. Um, mm. So we only usually have the bones. Now, yes. there's been an increasing body of evidence over probably the last 20 years to suggest that actually some proteins or the breakdown products of some proteins can actually survive geologic timescales. So that's very exciting. It's very interesting. We mm. don't fully understand, or I'm not sure we at all understand, the, the chemical basis for why these proteins are, are, are surviving. So things like keratin, the breakdown products of keratin, the breakdown products of hemoglobin um, have been found in the fossil record. And, and when that you actually look at those, they are the original proteins. Um, wow. So they are the breakdown products of these, these original proteins. So they're not replaced which is pretty amazing. It uh, is, yes. Whole, whole organs have never been found, so we don't have the no. whole organ of anything. There's been a, there was a report that there was a dinosaur heart found, and um, that turned out to be an iron nodule, an iron stone nodule. <laughs> uh, yes. And there was recently described um, a sort of fossilised brain. Um, maybe there were some aspects of the brain kind of structure in there, in this thing, but it was it was... Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure too much about it. I don't know. Yeah. But no other, you know, really, really good organs have been preserved. No, no. Well, you're talking about proteins that have been preserved there, but of course it would be more exciting to find DNA. <laughs> well, it would be, but you have seen Jurassic Park, right? You do know what happens when you find <laughs> DNA. And also I would have a job then, so I don't know. Um, happily for me... Um, the oldest DNA in the fossil record is about a million years old. Um, mm. And of course, dinosaurs died out 66 million years ago. So yes. at the yes. moment, we are some way away from finding DNA preserved that's anywhere near as old as the dinosaurs. Yes. Um, I'm, ne I'm not going to say never because, no. you know, I think these, these soft tissue discoveries that are being made are really um, fascinating and really exciting and and people are discovering new things every year, but uh, at the moment there is no DNA for you. Right. Okay. What a shame. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to I'm going to put a question up that's come in here. Mm -hmm. Why are dinosaur skulls so why why dinosaur sc skulls are so rare to find when compared to other dinosaur bones? 
Good question. Well, dinosaur skulls are made up of many, 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 many bones. So they're all, oh, I, I can't, I don't even know how many, more than 20 bones make up the skull of a dinosaur. And all of these bones are very thin, they're very fragile, they're very delicate. Now think of a big leg bone, it's just a big chunky single bone. So these fragile bones are much harder to preserve. Um, often when the animal dies, all these individual skull bones will fall apart. And it, they can also be crushed, although we could still find them if they were crushed. Um, yeah. But you know, they'll fall apart, that the skull disassociates, um, and they just crumble away and it, they're just difficult to find. So big chunky leg bones, they're quite easy to find. Um, very, very, very fine, delicate bones, they're much, much more difficult to find. And, and that's why dinosaur skulls are more rare. But some dinosaurs, um, for example, things like t uh, triceratops, their yeah. skulls don't fall apart. The bones of their skulls are fused together when they're adults. And actually, we've got tons of triceratops skulls um, oh, right. because they're, you know, they're, they're, they're massive. Yeah, yeah. They're big and they're chunky. Yeah. Tough skulls. Yeah. I think I think this next person hasn't asked a question, but he may he may know you. <laughs> Hi, Ali. <laughs> <laughs> How long do you think dinosaurs might have ruled the earth if they had not been wiped out by each other? That's a great question. I mean, there's been a lot of research recently. Actually, Ali, who just said hi, Ali. Hi, Susie. He has done this research very recently to show whether, to have a look at whether the dinosaurs were decreasing in diversity um, before the end of the Cretaceous. So there was kind of this narrative for a long time that the dinosaurs were doing pretty badly at the end of the Cretaceous period. And, and the meteor was the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, and actually, a lot of research now has suggested that that's really not the case and that probably the dinosaurs were doing just fine. Um, and that when the meteor hit, um, you know, it, it wasn't just a court that it, you know, it really it, it wiped them out. And, and it wasn't just a straw that broke the camel's back. And some really cool research that's been done looking at kind of um, ecological niches going into the period after the uh, Cretaceous period, which is called the Paleogene. Um, in the early part of the Paleogene, looking at the sort of niches, the, the environments that dinosaurs could have occupied in North America has suggested that actually the environments were almost more favorable for dinosaurs after the mass extinction than they were before. So I think that the dinosaurs would have continued to thrive. Um, I don't think there's any reason um, why they would have uh, gone extinct. Um, obviously, there were some major climate changes in the Eleusine. Yes. Um, when we yes. have big ice sheets growing in Alaska and, and yes. we really transition into this ice house climate. And I don't mm. know how the dinosaurs would have done then. Um, mm. I mean, the mammals did all right, but who knows? I don't know. Um, but I think if it wasn't for the meteor, dinosaurs would have carried on dominating terrestrial ecosystems. Yes. Well, you, you sparked off so many responses now because um, for a start, they weren't properly cold blooded, were they? Uh, so uh, another good question, another one that's very difficult to answer. Um, Cold-blooded and warm-blooded are kind of end members or, or yes, yes. the spectrum, really. So yeah. po we don't have... poikilothermic and homeothermic. Yeah, but we don't. We yeah, yeah. okay. So so we have things that can can control their internal body temperature and things that rely mm. on external um, yes. the external environment. Uh, uh, poikilothermic yes. and homeothermic, but. Mm. If you well, we can all go out and we can all go out and sunbathe, can't we? And we don't have to produce so much heat ourselves. Yeah, quite. Um, so you know, it is a spectrum. And also, you know, if you were brave enough to take a thermometer and go and shove it up an alligator's bottom, you would find that you know, the <laughs> core temperature of an alligator doesn't vary that much. Although we think of alligators as being cold-blooded, um, yeah. they are they have a very you know they're, they're large animals. They have a small surface area to volume ratio, so yes, yes. they don't lose their heat very effectively very efficiently um, and they're in water too which is a more constant environment that's a good but point. i think i think we ought to put out a warning here don't try this at home so yeah don't do that but you know i mean if you find an alligator probably don't but um they the dinosaurs were massive you know many of the dinosaurs were very very large and mm. um probably their biggest problem actually would have been losing their metabolic heat so you generate your heat through everything mm. you do, through eating and through moving and actually yeah. losing that heat would have, would have probably been a bit of a problem for them. Um, they didn't have so, fans, did they? 
they didn't have fans. Um, no. Nope. So, you know, they, whilst they were uh, not warm blooded, or, well, we don't know, birds are warm blooded. So, somewhere yes. along the line, two birds, warm bloodedness yeah. evolved. And exactly where that is, we don't know. Mm. Um, but w- another thing that we do know is that many of the dinosaurs, the meat eating dinosaurs, were feathered. And it yes. is, has been suggested that feathers, I mean, they certainly didn't evolve for flight because the first feathers no. that we see in the fossil record are not flight feathers. And they're sort no. of like wispy, almost hair like structures. Yes. And it's been suggested that they actually evolved to keep the, <laughs> uh, to keep the animals warm. So that they, they yes. may well, like mammalian hair, have been yes. for thermoregulation. So yes. probably warm bloodedness evolved somewhere along that line to birds within the meat eating dinosaurs. So animals like Triceratops and Stegosaurus, probably not warm blooded in the classic sense, but probably had an elevated metabolism relative yes. to lizards and things like that. Yes, it's a spectrum, isn't it? Because whereas a tortoise might be entirely dependent upon radiated heat, that it, it, it gets up in the morning and goes and sits in the sun, warms up and becomes more active. And then as the day goes into the evening, it goes back into the sun, whereas it's been in the shade happily all day. And it might, when it's too hot, it goes back into the sun to warm itself up for night. People don't understand that. They think of it as a one or the other polarized cold or hot but uh, yes it's a very good answer so the other thing that re- you made me think of is this meteor business i read a recent article about how there were we've just discovered apparently that there were frequent meteors little ones throughout the period of the dinosaurs uh we weren't previously aware that there was this shower of meteors but we we now have come upon some evidence that suggests there might have been um but we're actually talking about a really big impact for extinction aren't we yeah yeah absolutely um i might get the numbers wrong i mean the, the, the impact crater i think is uh, is 150 kilometers across i think that's right i think the impactor is uh supposed to be around 50 50 kilometers across, like it's in that sort of region. So huge, yeah. um, huge, huge, huge thing. We're not talking just, you know, a little lump of rock. We're talking no, no, a vast thing. And, a city. And this, a city. And this yeah. thing um, impacted just off the Gulf of Mexico, oh, within the Gulf of Mexico, just off the coast of, yes. of Mexico. Yes. And it yes. impacted yes. into rock that was um, carbonates and, and sulfates. And what this did was then vaporize that rock um, and then when it rained, uh, it actually rained acid rain back down because it, because those rocks were vaporized. Yes. Obviously, in the immediate vicinity of um, of the Gulf of Mexico, there would have been huge tsunamis. Um, yes. There would have been yes. also large forest fires. You know, huge amount huge amounts of fires. There would have been uh, magnitude eleven earthquakes rocking probably all yes. the way around the world. Um, Volcanic and, eruptions. Well, it's been suggested. It's been suggested that that it could have set off some volcanic eruptions. Difficult mm. to demonstrate. You have to be able to date yes. the volcanic eruptions extremely precisely, which you know usually you can do, but um, it yeah. hasn't. It's not. It's not certain, but potentially. Mm. Um, but also, it would have basically thrown so much dust into the atmosphere that it would have caused yes. a great deal of global dimming, um, and this would have resulted yes. in um, a lot of plant life dying off. Um, yes just because the plants couldn't photosynthesize. So there were probably yes. numerous kill mechanisms. Um, and depending on where animals were around the globe, those kill mechanisms probably took different length, uh, you know, different length yes. of time to affect them. But yes. probably the extinction took no more than 100 years or something like that. So it was, oh, it was okay. geologically instantaneous, uh, yes. but probably all of the dinosaurs um, went extinct within that sort of time frame. All, all the big ones, yes. Or the non-avian dinosaurs. Y- yes. <laughs> yes, because, of course, the dust cloud would have gone round the Earth probably near the middle because of the Gulf of Mexico, which is the crater, effectively, isn't it? Uh, no, what, what? it's not. It's just it's just off no? the offshore. It's a bit smaller than the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah. It's just off the Yucatan ah. Peninsula. It's actually buried in sediment, the crater now. So oh, it's right. discovered yes. by um, seismic profiling. So scanning... Uh-huh. Um, yes. subsurface with sound waves um, and they were able to mm. discover the crater the crater actually within the sediment so it's not yes. exposed yes. at the surface of the earth 
Yes, yes, because of course under the water you get a lot of sediment all the time, don't you? Yes. So, stegosaurs. What are those plates on its back for? Another excellent question that I don't have an answer for. Um, there have been lots of different ideas. Um, going back to the warm-blooded, cold-blooded discussion. Um, Stegosaurus. So stegosaurs are actually a group of dinosaurs um, that have around 14 or 15 different members, not just Stegosaurus. Mm. So everybody knows Stegosaurus, mm. of course, it's one of the most iconic dinosaurs. But actually yes. the first Stegosaur found was found in Swindon in a brick pit. So um, <laughs> there you go. They're, they're, they're known, I know, who, would have, who thought? But they're known from all around the world. Um, I knew um, I knew Swindon must be famous for something. <laughs> I don't know that Swindon is famous for that, but um, yeah. Anyway, um, apologies uh, to all those people from Swindon <laughs> who are watching. Yeah, I'm sure it's very nice. Um, yes. I don't know where I was now. Oh yeah, Stegosaurus. Stegosaurus had um, had really big, kind of very broad, triangular shaped plates. Yes. It seems that lots yes. of the other Stegosaurus probably just had kind of more spike-like plates. So oh, right. um, mm. people have suggested that Stegosaurus itself. Um, might have used its plates to help radiate this metabolic heat that it was building up. Um, mm. And this seems like a sensible suggestion, but it's super hard to test. So um, people have kind of calculated the surface area of the plates and, and, and done some kind of, you know, fairly, um, well, assumption-filled uh, calculations and have suggested that, yeah, you know, it might have worked. Um, but, you know, it is, it is, it's very difficult to test that. Um, but... I don't think that the other stegosaurs um, actually had the, the surface area to volume ratio of those plates to, to use them as heat radiators because they were much more spike like. Now, they, it, mm. they might, you know, lots of these sort of structures in, in animals are actually used for more than one function. And so yes. Yes. even crocodilian scoots, which are the kind of bony scoots and the bony plates in the back of a crocodile, mm. they even yes. can use them for some thermoregulation. So probably stegosaurs did something with them oh. to do with that kind of thing, but it probably wasn't the reason that they evolved. Um, one of the things that, I mean, one of the things that I've noticed a lot in working on these different stegosaurs from around the world is that they all have quite different shaped plates for different species. Um, it's difficult because stegosaurs, despite being such iconic dinosaurs, we don't actually have a very good fossil record of them. They're really, really rare as fossils. Um, yes. So we only have something like five or six complete skeletons of stegosaurs from probably oh. two, maybe three species. So we really don't have a good fossil record of them at all. So it's it's a little bit difficult, um, but it looks like they had kind of different shape plates, all of the different species. And so I think that it could be something, again, to do with sex. It could be something to do with intraspecific recognition, making sure you're mating with the right people, potentially mm. in an ecosystem yes. where maybe more than one of these species were living alongside each other. Um, yes. It could be some sort of display function, either uh, sexual display or possibly um, to kind of deter predators. So one of the things that we probably do know about these dinosaurs is that they weren't runners. Um, they were, they just, their limbs are not built in a manner that would have allowed them to move very quickly at all. They had very short strides with their forelimbs, yes. so they probably couldn't move very fast at all. So I don't yes. think that they were bounding across the plains uh, like a gazelle outrunning no. an Allosaurus. You know, I, I, I think no. that wasn't happening. So they had to defend themselves in some way. And they have these spikes yes. at the end of the tail, which would have yes. been a very fearsome weapon. And there's actually a few fossils yes. where we've got bones of Allosaurus that have sort of uh, have been healed. They've got, they've got um, uh, holes in or, or uh, pathologies where it looks like a stegosaur tail spike has actually impacted and then the bone is healed around the spike. So it's just pretty cool fossils. Um, so it's possible that Stegosaurus was using its tail as a weapon, but it might also have used its plates just to make it look bigger and more scary. Um, yes, so yes. I was in a museum studying uh, a Stegosaur in uh, Australia one time, and they were actually, it was on a part of a traveling exhibition and they were taking it down. Um, and I went in and saw it on the first day and it had all its plates up. And then as, as yes. they uh, took the plates off, and they, they, as they took it down, they took the plates off first and suddenly it just looked much smaller. You know, the animal just oh. looked, it just looked like a much yeah. smaller animal. And right. so I just wondered, you know, is this is this something that, that, that maybe they were using to just make themselves look big and scary? Yes. Uh, yes. But all May of those ideas it... are just untestable, basically. So it's really yes. hard to say. 
Did it look much tastier without the... <laughs> <laughs> it looked equally as dusty and bony, to be honest with you. <laughs> yes, it, it reminds me of those uh, caterpillars that have hair all over them. I think that may be designed to make them unpleasant in the mouth. Right. So, right. you know, if you've got if you've got a lot of spiky bits, so, yeah, it's, it deters biting. It does. But I think, you know, particularly Stegosaurus with these very thin plates. Now, they were, they were very, they were bone, they were very thin bone. And then they were probably covered mm. in a layer of keratin. Now, I think mm. if you're Allosaurus with a bone crunching bite, and we measure, people have measured the bite force of Allosaurus, and, and we know it yes. can crunch through bone. Um, yes. It, I think it would have been like eating a pack of Pringles, to be honest, just chomping through a Stegosaurus <laughs> backbone. I'm not sure it would have put up much of a challenge. So that's why I think that they're probably display structures. I suspect that they evolved from um, yes. structures that were real armour. So they probably did protect the back of the animals. But these very, yes. very hypertrophied spines, they're, they're restricted just to the very back. There's nothing yes. on the sides of the animal. Um, yes. It just, you know... It doesn't look like the ultimate arrangement for a set of armor, you know, and right. they actually seem to have lost that armor on the sides of their body. So I oh, think it's probably right. a display structure of some form. But yes. As I say, very hard to test. Well, now you've mentioned Pringles, I've got to say that other potato snacks are available. <laughs> yeah, maybe we can get some sponsorship in here. <laughs> so here we have another question. Um, what is this here? Oh. This is an interesting question. Why in all those millions of years did the dinosaurs not seem to develop higher order brain functions like ours? Ooh. Ooh. Um, well, nor have any other animals, I would say. Um, mm. And there are uh, kind of different types of intelligence, I guess. So birds yeah. use tools, crows use tools. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, Despite but, having yeah. very tiny brains, even tiny in ratio to the size of their body. Yeah, I mean, dinosaurs had had really, really tiny brains in in comparison to their body mass. I think I read somewhere, I don't know whether it's true, that Stegosaurus had the smallest brain per unit of body mass of any animal, any terrestrial animal, terrestrial vertebrate, which is quite. Well, there's a clip. There's a claim to fame. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't, I don't there... know the answer to that. I don't. I don't know. I don't know how. I don't know why we evolved um, yeah. these sorts of, you know, no, our no. intelligence. I don't know how that happened, and and I suspect we we you know we're the odd ones out, not the dinosaurs. There you yes. know, there are all sorts of different animals that haven't, um, but only the primates did, and I don't know why that's the case. But I don't yes. think I don't think the dinosaurs are to blame. <laughs> well, why is that impossible question to answer for anybody, let alone scientists, isn't it? I think it is. I think it is, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So is, is there, I, I've heard somewhere that um, some of the really large dinosaurs had a, another brain in their tail. Is that correct? Not really. Um, again, Not really a brain. That, that comes from Stegosaurus, actually. It's such an icon of the dinosaurs, yeah. but actually other dinosaurs did have it too. So what they have is in their sacrum, which are the vertebrae that attach to the hip region, um, yes. they have the, the neural canal. So your neural canal is the bit where the sort of your spinal cord runs through. And that mm -hmm. is expanded um, mm -hmm. in some of these dinosaurs. And early on, sort of, you know, in, in, the, in the latter part of the 19th century, um, this was suggested to be a second brain. And it was actually somewhat larger than the actual brain. Um, of oh. these dinosaurs. Um, yes. it, it probably wasn't really a brain. It might well have been no. a collection of nerves that help control the yes. legs. Um, yes. Many animals actually have a kind of, you know, expanded um, uh, uh, area there in, in the sacrum. So yes. I don't think it really was a second brain. No, no a giant ganglion. Yes, exactly. exactly. Mm. Yes. Well, I'm going to put up some more questions here because we're coming towards the end of our time. Uh, somebody wants to know. We don't have this person's <laughs> name, unfortunately. Did Do I you have... have a dinosaur top trumps? Uh, who, no, I don't who's... have dinosaur top trumps. Um, who was my favourite? Oh, sorry, I don't have it. And do you know what? I, I even have a seven-year-old and she doesn't have it either. 
She likes living animals, not really dinosaurs. <laughs> so you're um, an but... equal opportunity dinosaur lover. <laughs> <laughs> well, my favourite dinosaur is, is is Stegosaurus, as you might have guessed. So I would probably go for that one. Great. And do you have a favourite fossil? Because when we were talking to Dinosaur Isle people, Alex in particular, had found a really stunning fossil, which was his favourite because he'd found it. And he was very proud. Do you have one of those? Um, I kind of have two equal favourites. Is that OK? Um, sure, so, yeah. So my first one, it, I've, I, I've mentioned one of them already. It's the Stegosaur found from Swindon. Um, my Stegosaur found from Swindon is um, it was a specimen that I worked on a lot during my PhD and I spent many hours with it um, during that time so I feel quite close to it um, and it's on display in the Natural History Museum and it's in the Marine Reptile Gallery and on one wall there's all these incredible specimens of complete marine reptiles and they're stunning I mean they just take people's breath away if you haven't been you must come and have a look uh, we're reopening on the 5th of August by the way and yes. um, uh, it's this specimen, this poor stegosaur is on the other side. People just kind of walk past it on the way to the canteen. They don't notice, but it is um, one of uh, the earliest dinosaurs found from the UK. It's, it's, I love it. So that's my, that's my one. And my, my, my second is also a stegosaur, and that is Sophie the Stegosaurus. And Sophie the Stegosaurus is the world's most complete stegosaur. And it's also on display at the National Museum. So when you come in um, the exhibition road entrance, which is the kind of side entrance to the museum, Yes, um, yes. you are faced with Sophie as you walk through the door. It's a very, oh, very um, right. spectacular and evocative uh, mount. Yes. Um, yes. And it, we, it's actually the real fossil as well. The real the real bones are there. So many of the fossils yes. actually in our dinosaur gallery are cast. So they're copies of the real thing. Yes. Um, but Sophie, yes. we have all of the bones up. Um, and as I say, it's, it's the world's most complete stegosaur. And um, I got to study it for a year before it went on display when the museum acquired the specimen. So um, it's really a, a, a great specimen. Um, so you've, yeah. you've got a relationship. I have. And I recommend yes. you come and see it if you haven't done so. Well, yes, and I, I like the side entrance because it's nearer the tube station where you've got that <laughs> walkway through, haven't you? So um, what's happened to Dippy? Uh, yeah, Dippy, so Dippy, our Diplodocus, has been on tour. Um, Dippy came off display ooh, about two and a half years ago, I think, three years ago, and has been on display um, around the UK. And um, it's been great, actually. He's been to all its, I should say, I was calling he, but we don't know whether it was a he or a she. Actually, it was five separate individuals, so it could have been both. Um, but anyway, um, it's been on display all around the UK. Um, it's currently in Rochdale. The tour was shut down um obviously for covid uh, yes. but it's going to finish in rochdale and then i think it's moving the next stop on the tour is lincoln cathedral so dippy's mm. been all around the uk has been over to belfast um and it's been really really great because i guess people from all over the the uk who maybe don't normally come down to london have been able to enjoy yes. dippy and it's been great for the local museums as well um, yes. really help with, yeah. with visitor numbers to, to some of the local museums so it's been a fantastic tour um and it is a really it's a great specimen you know it really is uh, it is huge uh, I've, yes. been, I've been to a couple of the venues um i was up in newcastle uh where with dippy and i was also in belfast um and they've oh. you know the museums have done some lovely displays around it they've all done their own kind of interesting interpretations mm -hmm. um around the specimen and yeah it's been fascinating to see so i thoroughly recommend it dippy's on tour he is Here's a question from Tavian. He's Which been on our show before now. out that Spinosaurus was semi-aquatic. Um, so I, Spinosaurs are a type of meat-eating dinosaur. Um, they've, they've long been known. Um, and they're known from dinosaurs that have a very long, low snout. Now, we have actually a, a Spinosaur from the UK. It's called Baryonyx. It's one the, the holotype specimen, which we have at the Natural History Museum, is one of the most complete dinosaurs ever found uh, in Europe, the meat eating dinosaurs ever found in Europe. Um, and it has a very long, low, low snout. It has teeth that look just like a crocodile. It's actually quite difficult. You have to really know what you're looking at to be able to tell baryonyx teeth and, and, and crocodile teeth apart. Um, its snout looks like a crocodile. It's got nostrils elevated up on top of its head. It looks like a dinosaur that was feeding in and around water. Um, yeah. And it had long been interpreted uh, to be a piscivorous animal anyway. So mm. when 
they came out, um, Nizar and his team came out and said, you know, Spinosaurus, it's, it's it, we think it's aquatic, it's got some aquatic adaptations. Like everyone went crazy. And I was like, why? Why? I mean, dinosaurs, mm. they, 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 re they occupied all the terrestrial niches. They, they were yes. flying dinosaurs, they were burrowing yes. dinosaurs. Why, yes. why shouldn't that be an aquatic dinosaur? Why is that surprising? Um, yes. And, and I, I didn't really understand it. And then recently, they, they, these are again published this beautiful tale, um, which is, it just looks like a paddle. I mean, the thing looks like a massive newt. It's amazing. Um, oh. And, you know, I just, I don't, I don't understand what the problem is, honestly. I think it, it, it makes sense um, that these, these animals are found in environments where we find lots of crocs. They kind of look like crocs, um, but they've been found with fish in their stomach. So, what's the problem? So, oh, right. Um, yes. I think it's cool. Uh, but I, I, I wasn't, you know, I'm not in this sort of camp of people who were going, oh, my God, it can't be true. No, no. It wasn't exactly breaking news for you, was it? <laughs> well, it was still extremely cool. I actually got to see the paper a little bit before it came out because I was asked to comment on it by National Geographic. So uh, I got a heads up. Um, but <laughs> it's very, yeah. very cool. Yeah. So there's no way of telling whether they're salt or freshwater, is there? Um, well, we can look at the rocks. So we can tell oh, um, mm. what sort of environment the rocks were deposited in. So there in the Chem Chem, um, it's been interpreted as a as a probably a freshwater environment. So um, you know, there's lots of things like crocs in it. Um, there's lots of fish um, and other things, but it's it, it's sort of freshwater or lagoonal. I think uh, is generally considered to be the, the definitional setting. So um, so it's probably you know something that was living in in rivers, um, big rivers and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do a plug now, because as you said, we're about to open the Natural History Museum. Yeah, OK, so we are opening our doors to the public on the 5th of August. Um, we're going to we're very much looking forward to seeing everyone back and um, you have to book tickets. But of course, they're free. Um, we're asking visitors to please wear masks. Um, and most of our galleries are open, but not all of them. Um, can I also plug our website? So we also have, so John's showing the website here. And um, we also have a great dinosaur specific website, which is discover and then dinosaurs. And there's loads of resources on this. So if you have um, inquisitive children, young children, or um, actually there's a lot of content for adults as well. Um, or teenagers, then we have a loads of different content. Our digital teams have done an amazing job over lockdown, actually kind of updating this and, and, and uh, doing some really great stuff on it. But we do uh, have lots and lots of content on there all the time. We write a weekly, two weekly blog, uh, which goes on here. Um, so there's lots and lots of things to find and see and interesting stories um, that I hope you'll enjoy. Fantastic. And you have been wonderful. Thank you very much. I hope Thank that, uh, well, I hope you've enjoyed it too. I have. Great questions. Thank you. Good, good. And maybe if, if we ask you nicely, you might be prepared to come back another day? Of course. Always delighted to. Excellent. Now, I want to tell everybody else that next Wednesday, we have Professor Lee Cronin from Glasgow University. And the subject we're going to be discussing and dealing with is A biogenesis. So be prepared for that. Eight o'clock Wednesday next week. Susie, thank you very much. Take thank the you. rest of the day off. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.